Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Eric, I'm the Account Manager at Connecting Up in TechSoup New Zealand. We're part of the Info Exchange Group, a not-for-profit social enterprise that tackles the biggest social challenges by the creative use of technology. For those of you that haven't attended a webinar session with us before, Connecting Up in TechSoup New Zealand to facilitate training of online webinars, workshops, boot camps, and webcons to help the social sector upskill in all digital areas. And you can check out more on the training section on our websites. Today, I'm really excited to welcome you to join today's webinar, which is Self-Leadership, It's Time to Stop Surviving and Start Thriving, which is being presented by Mel Kettle. Mel is an internationally recognized expert at fully connected leadership and communication. With more than two decades of experience in strategic communication and leadership and a unique educational combination of a Master of Business and Marketing and a Master of Public Health, Mel is a valuable asset to leaders and teams that want to achieve real connection and sustained engagement. Clients rave about Mel's sharp insight, her ability to signify the complex and her capacity signify or simplify the complex and her capacity to mobilize people and ideas so they can increase their visibility and influence. Mel has been recognized in the Leaders Hum 2022 power list of the top 200 biggest voices in leadership and she's the host of the podcast This Connected Life and the author of Fully Connected and The Social Association. Now before we begin just a little bit of housekeeping here for myself all the lines are going to be muted so if you've got any questions or if you're responding to any of Mel's uh, requests or feedback throughout the webinar, that's okay. Just type it into the questions box. I'll be filtering that through to Mel so that can, she can see all of that as that comes through. Don't be shy. Uh, we do love it when these sessions are interaction are interactive. Um, so again, don't be shy. Don't hesitate. Just type it into the questions box. I'll see it. It'll go through to Mel. Don't worry. Now, if you've got any technical issues as well, that's okay. Just type it into the questions box. I'll do my best to troubleshoot that with you uh, throughout the session. And just on that note, if you've got other programs open, just try and close those down if you can. Um, that can sometimes affect the quality of the audio and video streaming of this webinar, and we want you to have the best experience that you can today. Um, now, as another note, this session is being recorded like most of our webinars are, so if you need to go back and watch anything later, you can. Uh, this session is, again, it's being recorded and I'll be uploading that either tomorrow or the day after, so keep an eye out for an email from myself with all of those details. You will get that along with a copy of the slide deck. Now, that is just about it for me, so Mel, I will hand it over to you now. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Eric, and welcome everyone. Thank you for um, giving up an hour of your day today to have a listen to what I have to say about fully connected leadership. I am coming to you from a hotel room in sunny Brisbane and I've strategically positioned myself so that you don't see the mirror. Uh, so hopefully I don't move too much. I would love to know where you are. So let's get a bit of interactivity happening. And if you would like to type into the chat box, oh sorry, into the question box, um, Eric will shoot that through to me. I'm just going to delete that. Oh no, it's not letting me, it's not letting me, what am I doing? Okay, I've just lost myself. There we go. Um, I, what was I going to say? Um, so yes, we're talking today about self-leadership, why we need to stop surviving and start thriving. And let's see if I can get my thing to be working. There we go. My click is all functioning. I've just done um, a similar session on this at a breakfast this morning, so I'm ready to go. I like these to be a conversation. So this is not just going to be me talking at you, um, even though you're all muted. I do want to have as much of an engaged conversation as we can. And so the way that I like to do that is through the question and um, through the question box. So please feel free to type in um, answers to your questions. I'm just trying to make the question box a bit bigger, which it's not really wanting to do. Maybe if I do that. Ooh, there we go, excellent. Now I can see that, fantastic. Oh, and we've got lots of people from lots of places. Melbourne, Parramatta, Atherton, Rotorua, New Zealand. You, um, more in Brisbane and more New Zealand and Sydney, fantastic. Um, so yeah, I do like to make these as interactive and as engaging as possible. So why, crazy, crazy thing. All right, too many, there we go. So why am I talking about this? I um, am a huge believer in prioritising ourselves because when we prioritise ourselves as leaders and as humans, we are happier, we're healthier, we're more engaged and we do a better job of 
work and life in general. I started to develop an interest in this topic when I was in my early 30s and I had just come out of a period of time where I was living alone in Sydney. I um, was working in a really stressful job and the one thing I was not doing was prioritising myself and I had a huge health scare thanks to having um, an enormously stressful job and chest pains all the time and um, high blood pressure, so high my doctor couldn't actually understand why I was walking around. So even though for the last 20 years I've been working a lot more in the leadership communication space, this work has always been at the top of my mind and something that I've always been encouraging my clients and my colleagues and my friends to think about. And I'm so interested in this topic that I wrote a book about it called Fully Connected, um, how great leaders prioritise themselves, reclaim their energy and find joy. And this book came out earlier in the year um, and it's I'm really proud of this book. I've put a lot of my heart and soul into it and a lot of what we're talking today are the core themes from the book. So there'll be a code at the end of the um, session where you can download a chapter of the book to see whether it's something that you might be interested in or not. And so stay tuned for that. But I'm curious to know, why are you here? What brings you here today? So if you'd like to type into the question box, I would love to know what prompted you when you saw this session on self-leadership to sign up. What is it that you're hoping to gain from this session? So please um, feel free to type in and I'll come back and respond to a few of those in a moment. It's really important to remember that as leaders, we have a responsibility to care for ourselves first because a lot of livelihoods rely upon us. And when we're fully connected, we are better versions of ourselves. We, um, and that makes us better leaders, both at work and at home and within our community. And I see that a couple of the responses want to become a better leader, want to help with burnout symptoms. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've run this session um, a lot over the last probably six to 12 months and particularly since the book came out in the middle of the year and the reasons that people sign up to do it and the reason that people are interested are all of the reasons that you're typing into the question box at the moment, wanting to be better, wanting to understand burnout more and manage it more and hopefully more than manage it, hopefully move through it, um, get some refreshers, understand how to manage work versus self-development and, and get some practical ways to put yourselves first. Well, we'll be talking about all of those things today. As leaders, we want our people to turn up to work, ready to do their jobs to the best of their ability. We want them to be satisfied by doing a good day's work. We want them to be happy, we want them to be healthy, and we want them to feel that they can come to us when things aren't quite right, whether that's at home or at work. And they can't do that or they won't do that if they don't understand or know what's expected of them or what's in it for them or what they need to do. And they can't or they won't do that if they are exhausted or overwhelmed or stressed or if they feel excluded or marginalised. And as leaders, it's really difficult to expect our people to turn up and do their best if we're not turning up and showing up as our best. And if we constantly turn up and we're exhausted because we haven't had a good night's sleep or we haven't had you know, many, many, many good night's sleeps or we've um, you know, maybe had a few too many wines, a few too many nights um, after work and we wake up feeling a bit sluggish or you know, we don't exercise enough, we've got underlying health issues that we're not dealing with, then it's really difficult to show up with the right energy to be able to um, focus on our work and energising the people around us. We've got heaps of challenges today as well that we need to work through and those challenges um, include things like having increased pressures with work and life. When was the last time you asked somebody how they are and they responded with some version of busy? Busy is my least favourite four letter word. I would, ju I just find that it's um, so often an excuse or a word that's used because we don't know other words to describe how we're feeling and what we're doing, but it's also just so endemic. And too often we wear busy as this badge of honour. Um, and busy so often means that we are spending our time doing things that are prioritised by other people and not necessarily prioritised by us. 
But even and even before COVID, you know, there'd been increasing pressure in the workplace. We'd been expected to do more with less. We had to manage customer expectations in a world where experiences determine repeat business. We had to motivate and inspire a frequently disengaged and multi-generational workforce. We had to stay competitive in increasingly disruptive markets. And I know that a lot of you are nonprofits, and I know that you're probably finding it more and more difficult to get people to donate to you and to volunteer with you and to work with you because there's just fewer people around and there's less money and there's less time apparently. So how do we manage all of those things? Um, and then so many of us are juggling working and home and family commitments and particularly those of us with school-aged children or with aging parents or living in homes that don't have a dedicated office space when you have to work from home. And um, I'm a Gen X and I look at my friends and my um, clients who are, you know, in their mid to late 40s and 50s and so many of them are dealing with young children or teenagers and with aging parents and with big jobs and with menopause if they're women or perimenopause. And I look at them and think, how are you coping and the simple answer is they're not. They're one step away from it all collapsing in a screaming heap. And it's just so important that they, and you if you're in that situation, take time to look after yourself, fill your own cup. You know, I'm, I'm really not a fan of the whole fill your own cup expression. I think it's been overused. So I like to say, you know, we recharge our phones every day, multiple times a day. Um, if you use it a lot, and we all do use it a lot, so why aren't we recharging our bodies and our minds and our spirits um, in the same way? We're also dealing so much more with loneliness and social isolation and anxiety and disconnection. And one in two Australians, according to Beyond Blue, report feeling lonely and more than half of CEOs say they feel lonely at work. And today we are more than twice as much twice as often likely to say we're exhausted because of work than we were 20 years ago. More than twice as often. Now I know 20 years ago when I was obviously 20 years younger I was exhausted by work and you know the fact that we're more than twice as likely to be more exhausted now is just crazy. We're also um, there's also a, such a big correlation between loneliness at work and work exhaustion. And the more you're exhausted, the lonelier you feel and the greater your risk of burnout becomes. So as leaders, it's so critical that we understand the impact of loneliness and social isolation because it can have massive ramifications on our personal health as well as on um, how we live and how we work. The number one reason people have long-term absences from illness in the workforce today is because of loneliness and depression and anxiety and stress. And so we need to be managing ourselves and making sure our people and our teams and our colleagues are looking after themselves as well so that we can turn up and do the great day of work that we want to do. Because, you know, the vast majority of us don't rock up at work and think, going to do everything I can today to have a really bad day <laughs> or to you know not do my job to the best of my ability most people don't think that way so you know what do we do to set ourselves up for greater success one of the other challenges that we face today that also prevents us from putting ourselves first is because is that we struggle to filter out the noise and the noise that's caused by amazing technological advances. I know I got my first mobile phone in the mid 90s in my one of my first jobs and I got my first laptop for work um, a couple of years after that and I just thought I have it made like I am now I was so proud of myself for getting this technology provided to me by my employer little realizing that that was the slippery slope to working you know 12, 15, 18 hour days in some cases and I know when I went through my burnout phase, I was working 18 hours a day. I was averaging 75 hours a week, every single week for a year. And that's not sustainable. And my body and my brain very, you know, partway through that year just went, no, we don't want you doing this anymore. And it started to shut things down. Um, we live our lives today though through our screens, whether we spend 12 hours a day in front of a screen on average and five or more of those hours are often on our phone and it's just so easy to get caught up 
with the emails and the technology and the Instagrams and the Facebooks and the LinkedIn and the and the YouTube and the Netflix and one of the stats or one of the quotes that I love and I say love not really loving is that Reed Hastings who's the CEO of Netflix came out about five years ago and said our biggest competitor is not net is not Hulu it's not Amazon Prime it's sleep our biggest competitor is that people will so often be watching our shows episode after episode after episode until they fall asleep in front of the TV. And you know how when you're watching, and um, maybe you don't do this, I know I do too often, is when you're watching Netflix and it, that little a notification pops up on your screen saying, do you want the next episode? Are you still watching? That comes up because they know that people fall asleep. And if you don't respond within a minute or two, it turns Netflix off. And if Netflix is connected to your TV in a certain way, it'll turn your TV off as well. How clever is that? Um, you can turn that feature off, I discovered. <laughs> but the first time I saw it, I thought, wow, have I been watching for that long? Yes, I have. I'd been watching for four hours and I hadn't moved. And I thought, okay, that needs to not continue. And then obviously the other noise that we've been struggling to filter out over the last three years has been Zoom and online meetings and moving everything to working from home for those periods of time in 2020 and 2021 meant that we were spending more and more and more hours in front of a screen where we may have gone previously to in-person meetings or out for lunch in a cafe or gone for walks we didn't have the capacity to do that with as much ease and so our screen times increased and that leads to greater exhaustion. We're also you know, afraid of the reaction to our vulnerability. We mistake self-care for selfishness and we're worried that if we take time to prioritise ourselves and to say to our employers, I'm not coping, I need a break, I can't do this many things, we worry that we risk losing our jobs or that we will be thought of as less than rather than having that celebrated. One of my cousins, when she had her second child, was really at the pinnacle of her career. She just had a huge promotion when she got pregnant and she was really worried about what the impact of having a second child and taking a year out for parental leave would have on her career opportunities. And her husband said to her, well, I'm happy to take a year out. And when he went and spoke to the head of HR in his firm, who was a woman, she just burst into tears and said, sorry, this is very unprofessional of me. She said, we put parental leave practices in place three years ago, and this was about 12 years ago now. And she said, you're the first man to ask for it. And she said, I will give you whatever you want because I want more men in this male dominated organization and industry to be taking the lead to provide the care for their children that women have so traditionally always had to do. And she said to my cousin's husband, why are you, I, I will do whatever you want, but why are you asking me? And he said, because my wife is, she, she took a, a year off with our first child and I think that it's my turn and her career is going amazingly and I want to support her as she supports me. And I just thought his vulnerability when he said that and the self-care that he was implementing for his wife, for her career opportunity was just, I, I was just so incredibly impressed by that. And the, his willingness to demonstrate a vulnerability that was embraced was such a great lesson to me and a reminder that not everybody belittles when you ask for things or say what you need or want. It's really important to remember as well that a key part of self-leadership is prioritising yourself and I can't emphasise that enough. Um, Michelle Obama a few years ago came out and said we need to do a better job of putting ourselves first on our own to-do list and she said this in an interview that she did with Barbara Walters um, probably one or two years, maybe one year into the first term of her husband Barack Obama being President of the United States and she said I make it really clear that my first responsibility is to myself. My not, excuse me, my not negotiable every day is that I exercise. My second responsibility is to my children 
and my husband and my third responsibility is to this country. And I loved how she talked about so openly how her first responsibility was herself because she recognised really quickly that if she didn't look after herself and her physical and mental and emotional health, then she would be a really bad first lady and her family would, she would personally suffer, her family would suffer and the country would suffer. And I just think, how can we do more of that in our lives? Um, because let's face it, if the first lady can do it, admittedly she had a whole lot more help than most of us probably have. Um, but at the end of the day, she also had a whole lot more responsibility than most of us have. Um, but we need to remember that putting ourselves first is not selfish and it's not just about caring about ourselves. It's about understanding what your most important priorities are so that you can manage them. And, you know, I'd love to know what are your priorities because I'm guessing that your top priorities are probably not work. I know my top priorities are looking after my health, spending time with my husband, going to the beach, um, being with my family and friends. That's what lights me up. That's what's important to me. Yes, I need to work. I love my job. I love what I do. I love my clients. But at the end of the day, they're not number one. Sorry, clients who are listening. But, you know, you need to develop that priority of putting yourself first at least some of the time. And why is it so important? Well, when we put ourselves first, we're happier. We, uh, and when we're happier, we're better employees, we're more resilient, we're better workers, we're more engaged, we're more optimistic and we're less likely to be absent from work. We're also going to be healthier. We're going to be mentally and emotionally healthy. We're going to feel better at us, about ourselves. We're going to live longer. We're going to be more capable of managing when things go wrong. And we're going to be more capable of managing when there's stressful situations that we find ourselves in. Um, healthy people also have more energy and they have fewer medical costs. And who doesn't want a bit more money in their pocket because you're not having to buy medication, go to the doctor and see health professionals as often as you do when you're not well. We're also more human and it's so important to remember that the workplace of 2020 of the 2020s is increasingly based on human relationships. Disconnected leaders, leaders that don't put themselves first or don't understand the value of creating real and human connections with their colleagues and others tend to operate out of self-interest, demonstrate poor insight and judgment and they have disconnected if not dysfunctional teams. When we're more human, we have a far greater capacity for developing and strengthening relationships. And we do this by showing up with authenticity, vulnerability and empathy. When we put ourselves first, we energise our co-workers and we energise the people that are around us, whether that's at work or at home. <coughs> Excuse me. We understand what gives us energy, we understand what takes our energy and we know what we need to do to recharge our own batteries. And when we feel energised and invigorated, we pass those feelings on to the people around us. So, you know, um, you may have heard the expression, misery loves company. Nobody likes being around a misery gut. It, it, the opposite is the same when we're happy and energised. People want to be around us because they want some of what we've got. And so um, think about how you can be more energising at work and what is it that you need to do for that. When we put ourselves first, we're more likely to communicate with conviction and communicating with conviction is the cornerstone of trusted leadership. Our purpose shines through and it leaves a lasting impact and we're unafraid to be authentic, which earns us loyalty and trust. And it, for those of us in leadership positions, when we are convincing and we speak with conviction, communicate with conviction, we create change and we energise individuals and teams, which leads to alignment of values and purpose and achieves greater results. And then finally, we create cultures of belonging. And a culture of belonging is where everybody feels like they belong at work. Everybody understands those unwritten codes that are in all workplaces, those parts of the culture that aren't written down, but that people understand and know about inherently. And when we're fully connected to ourselves, we're more likely to feel like we belong. And then that has that flow on effect that we've talked about. Um, 
and our people feel like they belong when they feel valued and cared for and that um, creates greater alignment in the workplace which leads to, again to better business outcomes so you know all of this leads to better business outcomes and if you think about it from a home perspective it leads to more cohesive family life as well so before we can be fully connected we need to make an assessment as to where we might be feeling or where we're at on this surviving to thriving um, model that I've come up with when we are surviving and I have been in survival mode twice in my life once for a long time and thankfully once for a much shorter time it's when you feel like you're going through the motions to get through the day you feel completely overwhelmed with life and you just don't know what to do where to turn you've got no energy you've got no self-confidence or very little self-confidence and life is really really difficult and it's such a horrible horrible debilitating place to be in and I know so many people who are there or who have been there in the last couple of years because it's been hard and so we need to recognize that's where we're at and recognize that we want to get out of that phase so the next stage is when we're stuck we feel like we um, are a bit unsure about what to do to get unstuck. We're often unfocused and we're unhappy and we feel like we're going in circles, a bit like that merry-go-round um, or that hamster wheel that you can't get off. Um, when we're stuck, we need to recognise the action that we need to take is that it's our responsibility to move through that. And I'm not saying that you need to do it alone, but you need to take responsibility for where you're at and acknowledge that there are opportunities to move away from that stuck phase in a positive direction. When we are achieving, we get noticed for getting things done. Um, however, quite often this is at the expense of other people's priorities. So when we're in the achieving phase, we quite often say yes to everything. We are more likely to um, be responding to email as soon as it comes in rather than having allocated email times throughout the day. It's at this stage that we need to be replenishing our energy and replenishing our self-confidence so that we can move towards shining. When we're shining, we are cheerful, we're optimistic, we have greater flexibility because we recognise what's important to us, but we also recognise that there's sometimes we need to do things that are important to other people, but we can make decisions around what that looks like. Um, we're focused with our time. We've got great self-awareness and we know what it means to prioritise ourselves. Um, our energy is great and, and you know, lifting and we're much more confident in how we, um, in what we do and what we say and what we think and what we feel. And then finally, we're thriving. Thriving leaders are fully connected leaders. You know your limits and you know you're, and you're confident and you're at your peak with your personal energy and focus. And importantly, you feel like you're in control of your life. And who doesn't want that? Where you know that there's things that you can't control, but you focus on what you can control and you live your life because you love your life and you have great energy, you're really confident, and all those things we talked about, um, about why we don't put ourselves first, you have an answer for all of those in the positive so that you know how important it is to look after you so that you can look after others. So have a look at this, and I'd really love you to think about where are you and Eric if we can have the poll um, we've got a poll so I'm just really curious to know whereabouts do you sit on this ladder and we'll just take a couple of minutes or a moment um, to come up with for people to respond <laughs> And I know you have to pick one. Sometimes we, we um, you know, waver between a couple, but pick one, please. So if you're watching the recording, just sit with this for a moment and think about, you know, really think about, have an honest reflection of where are you? 
where's your life right now? Are you surviving? Are you stuck? Are you achieving? Are you shining or are you thriving? Oops. All right, we've got the results. We've got most people um, are either surviving or stuck, yep. And 32% achieving, 9% shining and thriving, yeah. I reckon I've done this poll or asked this question of probably 5,000 people in the last six to nine months. And the, I'm actually really impressed that the surviving number is as low as it is because it's very rare that I haven't had 50 to 60% of respondents saying that they're surviving or stuck. So if that's where you are right now, I absolutely understand where you're coming from because I have been there. And the fact that you're here today to look for some solutions to try to get yourself out of that is a real testament to you starting to put yourself first. So congratulations and thank you for doing that. Um, for those of you who are thriving and shining, I love that. You have clearly done a lot of hard work to get to that point because it is hard work to get to that point. Um, and for those of you who are achieving, hopefully you'll get a few things um, out of this session where you can that you can implement into your lives to start to move up into shining and thriving. So um, you can turn that off now if you don't mind, Eric. Thank you very much. And I will move back through here. So how do we go from surviving to thriving? Well, the first thing I think if you are stuck in that survival and stuck phase and 50% of you are, then the first thing is to um, recognise where you're at and you have. And the, the thing that worked for me the most is that I had a doctor who was amazing and I walked into his doctor's surgery when I was in the peak of my survival mode and he said, how are you? And I cried for 30 minutes. I cried to the point of hyperventilating, um, which was not a pretty sight for either of us. But once I calmed down enough to put a coherent sentence together, he was an amazing support and just, just having someone to listen to me. So the first thing I really encourage you to do is to find someone to talk to and it might be a doctor, it might be another trusted healthcare professional, it might be a trusted colleague at work or your or your boss if you've got that great trusting relationship, um, might be a partner, might be a friend, it might be somebody through your organisation's employment assistance program if that's something that your organisation runs. But I strongly, strongly encourage you to talk to somebody about how you're feeling because they will probably have some solutions for you and be able to provide you with the support that you need right now. Um, there's three things that fully connected leaders have. There's three steps that we need to take to be prioritising ourselves. And the first step is that we need to become more self-aware. When we are self-aware, we have much greater understanding of who we are. We understand what we stand for, we, what our feelings and emotions are, um, what our attitudes and behaviours are, and we understand our values and what our core priorities in life are. Um, I am a big fan of Brene Brown and she did some research a couple of years ago that said people generally can only articulate three emotions and it's happy, sad and mad. And I laughed because somebody had asked me how I felt the previous day and I said happy. And I thought, okay, there's better reasons, there's better words. And when I felt sad or angry or cranky, I would use sad or mad. And so we need to be, um, self-aware leaders have a much better understanding of all of the different all of the different types of emotions and feelings and they acknowledge that it is okay to feel that way um, because they have acknowledged and they've named that feeling. Excuse me, I've, I think I might have eaten my breakfast a bit fast, it's giving me the hiccups. Um, a lack of self-awareness is one of the biggest obstacles that we can have to progressing through life because when we don't have um, that self-awareness I just realised my laptop's about to die. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly plug that in. When we don't have good levels of self-awareness, there we go. Um, hopefully that's going to work. Looks like it might be. When we don't have good levels of self-awareness, then people 
often perceive us in ways that we're not aware of. So when we have a greater level of self-awareness, um, we understand how people see us. And if you want people to see you as somebody who is, um, who, you know, who they want to be around, who's a positive influence, then when you have that level of self-awareness, you know whether or not that's truly happening for you or not. There's a few ways we can um, become more self-aware and we can do that by creating the time and space for reflection. We can practice mindfulness, we can listen to understand and we can be actively curious. Now what does all that mean? Well creating the time and space for self-reflection, a lot of people like to do that through meditation or through um, and mindfulness through meditation or through sitting down and frequently reflecting on how things have gone and how where you're at in your life. One of my friends has a meeting with herself every Monday. So every Monday morning she takes herself off to her favourite cafe, has a really nice coffee and a piece of cake and just asks herself a series of questions about how the last week was. What was it that worked for the week at that's passed and what didn't work and how did she feel when things went as she wanted them to or when things didn't and so she and then she takes all of that and she thinks how could I have responded differently or how did my behavior um, where could my behavior have improved and then she looks at the week ahead and tries to preempt where there might be a tricky situation and preempt how she can put a more um, positive or kind spin on that and not be so hard on herself. One of the other things that's really important when it comes to self-awareness is listening and asking questions and observing. And so how often do we have conversations with people where we don't really listen or observe their behaviour or what they're telling us? And um, I worked with this man a long time ago who we did some staff research and the research was not very complimentary towards his leadership. And I tried to um, probably quite awkwardly explain to him that he didn't have, people didn't have a very high regard for him and his leadership. And his response was, they're all lying. And I said to him, you can't, you can't just say that people's feelings are wrong or lies because this is how they feel. And his lack of, um, his self-awareness was lacking and it was really apparent that it was lacking because he thought he was God's gift, but people would leave rooms when he walked into them. So, you know, think about what, how do people respond around you? And if you're wanting to get a sense of what people, um, how people feel about you and what people think of you and what your core strengths might be, ask. And yes, that can be very confronting. Um, but an easier way is to observe how do people behave when they're around you? Do they look frightened or do they they look like they value your time? Um, and that's one great way of just starting to become a bit more self-aware. The other thing that we need to think about when it comes to becoming um, to self-leadership is how do we motivate ourselves? What motivates us to do things to achieve our goals? And so have a think about what is it that you want to achieve out of life? And if that's too big of a question, then what is it that you want to achieve between now and the end of the year in your job? Or what is it that you're wanting to achieve next year in your work? And, um, you know, self-motivated people take responsibility for their lives. They make things happen rather than waiting for luck to come their way. They make decisions and they back themselves. And that isn't to say that they don't have self-doubt or fear of failure because they do, but they understand what that is and they know how to move through the fear so that they can pursue what's important to them. Um, we're motivated by so many things. We're motivated and, and guided and determined by things that involve our individual personalities and our life experiences and our education and our culture and our upbringing. And so a core part um, of understanding what motivates us is to look at all of those things and to think through what is it that I want to achieve and then putting in a plan to take action to do that. So if you want to become more self-motivated and if you've got goals that you're wanting to achieve, then put a plan in place. Work out what that is and work out what it is that you need to do to take action. What are the things that you need to do in order to make that goal 
come to fruition. So it might be a financial goal, it might be a weight loss goal, it might be an organize, like a work related, um, you might want a promotion. What do you need to do to get there? I remember early in my career, I had a lot of um, big career aspirations and I would ring up recruiters and say, I'm really interested in this job, but I know that I don't have enough years of experience yet. What do I need to do? What are some of the things that I can start doing now so that I can have a job like this in five years or 10 years? I've always been a planner. So, you know, I'm sure that'll, that's no surprise to people who know me. I plan everything to the nth degree and I'm trying to learn to be more flexible. Um, but then map out what you need to do, create habits and routines so that you are more likely to achieve your goals and then track your progress and celebrate the successes. And I don't mean just celebrate the big successes, but celebrate the small things. I said to one of my friends recently who's got huge health issues. I said, what's something great that's happened this week? And she said, I got out of bed every day this week. And she said, I managed to make breakfast for myself every morning and not have to rely on the carer who comes in to see me to do it. And I just thought, good for you, good for you. Another friend of mine who's got long COVID managed to go for a walk for the first time in three months recently without having a walking stick or without having to be in a wheelchair within five minutes. You know, these sound like really small, simple things to us, but these are huge things for, for these people. So think about what is it that you're wanting to, to achieve and what is it that you need to do to celebrate so that that spurs you to do more. And then the third thing that um, self-leadership, that leaders that look after themselves and that um, are fully connected do is they prioritise self-care. And self-care looks like many different things to many different people. And it's, um, it's so important to understand what self-care looks like for you. And there's a few not negotiables that I believe um, we need to focus on when it comes to self-care. And the first is we need to make sure we need to get a, oh, not even making sure, we need to have um, a benchmark of what our health is like. So if you haven't been to the doctors in a year or longer, it's probably time to make an appointment to just have a basic healthcare check. And that might be things like your blood pressure, it might be things like your cholesterol, it might be a heart health check if you're in your 40s or 50s or older. Um, it might be having a mammogram or it might be having a pap smear or it might be having a prostate check or it might be going to the dentist if you haven't been for ages or going to the optometrist. Um, I went to the optometrist recently and he said to me, you need to come every year now. Now that you're in your 50s and I just went, whoa, where did that happen? He said, you need to make sure your eyes, you're at the age where things can start to go wrong more quickly and more um, significantly. So come back every year other than every three years. And I went, oh, okay, that's good to know. Um, but think about if you haven't had a health check for a while, how do you know everything's working? How do you know it's all doing what it needs to be doing? If you've got any lumps or bumps on your body that don't look normal, go and get those checked out. I had a spot on my leg nine years ago that turned into, that was a melanoma. And if I hadn't had it checked out, I would be dead because it was really aggressive. And that was such a huge confronting conversation to have with the surgeon after he'd cut it out. But it also made me realize, thank God I recognized that that spot changed. Because when I'd had a skin check three weeks earlier, it didn't look like it did then. The other things when it comes to prioritising self-care are getting the basics right, looking what do you eat, what's your nutrition like, How? what's your sleep habit like, are you getting eight hours a night at least five nights a week or are you not? Um, what does your exercise routine look like, are you getting out and having, taking the time to exercise every day? And do you just plonk yourself down at your desk in the morning and not move until lunchtime and then plonk back down again and not move until it's time to go home? Or do you get up and walk around and you know walk to the printer or walk for a cup of tea and do you move every 30 to 45 minutes? Because our muscles start to atrophy after 40 minutes of inactivity, particularly once we're over the age of 40. 
when it comes to self-care, it's so important that we have boundaries and we understand what are our priorities and what's important to us and what are the boundaries around how we want to live our lives. And that might look like how often do you work weekends? How often do you work through lunch? How often do you um, say yes to things that you really would rather say no to, but you don't actually know how to say no because you want to be seen as being a people pleaser or you are a people pleaser. Um, and remember that every time you say yes to somebody else, you're saying no to something for yourself. And one of my friends said to me the other day, she reminded me that every time, if you say no more often, then every time you say yes, that will be more valued and appreciated because you're, that people will be used to you saying no to things. So think about how you can do that more frequently. And then do what brings you joy. You know, there's so much negativity in the world and we need more joy in our lives. So what are the things that you love to do? And you're welcome to type into the question box. What are the things that you can do that will give you more joy? Last year, I moved from Brisbane to Caloundra on the Sunshine Coast. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to walk on the beach every day. And I do. And that gives me joy and I've been in Brisbane today um, but I went to the beach yesterday before really early in the morning before I had to drive down to Brisbane because I wanted to get my daily beach fix and I'll be home later this afternoon and I'll go for a quick walk on the beach this afternoon weather pending I think there's meant to be storms a bit later um, but that's what fills my soul that's what gives me joy and that's what calms me down and when I go to the beach I frequently I'll go with my husband we'll spend time we'll have a conversation about stuff or we'll just walk in our own with our own thoughts so think through what can you do what are some of the things that you love to do that you can look forward to doing later today or tomorrow and then the final thing we can be doing when it comes to prioritising self-care is practising gratitude. Because when we feel grateful for something and we verbalise and articulate that, our blood pressure reduces, more oxygen flows through our body to the bits that need it, and we feel calmer and we feel happier. So I've talked about a lot um, today. And what I've got, I can see there's a few questions, so I'll come to those in a moment. But I want you to think about what is it that you can be doing to prioritise yourself more. Um, I've talked about a lot, but I'd like you just to think about and maybe share with everyone in the question box what's one thing that you can do today or tomorrow to start prioritising yourself. And maybe it's making a doctor's appointment. Maybe it's doing something that brings you joy. Maybe it's doing some exercise. Maybe it's making an appointment with yourself to sit down and reflect on what's really important to you. But I would love to know. And there's a few, oops. Say no more often. Yeah, it's really hard to say no when you're used to saying yes. My husband is a people pleaser. And so he says yes to everything, including, you know, working, six or seven shifts a week when he's only really wants to work four or, you know, staying later or, you know, saying yes to people who he really has zero interest in spending time with. So saying no more often is something he's been learning to do. And I'm really proud of him every time I hear him on the phone saying, no, I can't do that because I know how hard it is for him to say no to people. So before we go, um, and I'll come to the questions in a moment. Whoops, that's not the one we want. This is the one we want. So think of the one thing. And um, there's some free resources I mentioned. If you would like to this, so um, scan the QR code, it'll take you to a web page where you can register for um, um, a white paper that I've written on this topic, which has some of the slides that we've talked about. It's got the model and it's got some of the notes that I've shared with you. Um, and there's also a, um, what else was on there? Um, the first chapter of my book that you can download if you're interested in that. And so click on that if you're interested and I'll just come back to some of the comments and some of the questions, I'll get more sleep, yep. So one thing, say no more often, exercise for neck and shoulder pain, sitting at a desk sucks, yes. 
Yes, it does. Every time I have a massage, they say, what do you do for a living? No, don't tell me, you sit at a desk. <laughs> Step back from the illusion that I have to be there for everyone, more me time. Yeah, I really like that. It's so important. Earlier bedtime consistently, restart exercise routine. Sometimes you need to take the step to change companies. It can seem scary. Yeah, yeah, I've done that a few times. Um, the question that um, Deanne has asked about how to do best deal with narcissistic leaders, you will never change them because their level of self-awareness is at a point where they don't believe that that's what they are. And the only thing that you can do is either move to a different part of the organization or get a different job. And I know that is a really hard and scary and huge decision. And it fascinates me how many people like that rise through the ranks to senior leadership roles. I'd like to think that um, that will happen less in the future, but you cannot change those people. There's just not. Um, so you need to put steps in place to protect yourself because that is the only way that you can deal with them. And that might seem a bit harsh, but I've worked with people like that and it's a horrible position to be in. A um, couple of others, no more sleep, no technology at home. Yeah, I decided about three years ago that my sleep was letting me down or more to the point, my lack of sleep was letting me down. So made some really big decisions about focusing on sleep. I put in a really solid sleep routine that starts about two hours before I wanna to go to bed. And so I go to bed about 9.30 most nights with the lights out by 10. Um, I've got, my phone goes automatically into focus mode at 10 o'clock at night, which means I get no notifications through the night, no phone calls. There's one or two people that can break through that, um, one or two family members, just in case of you know unintended family emergencies. Um, my husband used to be one of those people. He's not anymore because he um, um, last night rang me about five times after 10 o'clock and I was a sound asleep, so I didn't get woken up. Um, the other thing that I did is I, go to bed with a book, with a real book, not with an iPad or an e-reader, um, with a hard copy book and try and read that for half an hour to just calm my brain down. I do like reading murder thrillers, so they're not always the best choice just before I go to bed. Um, I have a herbal tea. I try to drink less alcohol. I don't drink caffeine after lunchtime because I know that impacts my sleep. Um, the other thing I did uh, last year, I bought an aura ring, which is a sleep, it's a, it's a wearable um, sleep and exercise tracker and I don't know whether you can see it it's just here on my finger um, it's O-U-R-A but I don't like wearing a watch so that's why I bought the ring and it's been a game changer in terms of managing my sleep because it lets me see how much sleep I get each night and what the quality of that is whether it's deep sleep, REM sleep, light sleep or no sleep um, and it also lets me see that if I eat later or if I have alcohol later or if I'm reading on an iPad, all those things have a negative impact on how I sleep that night. So um, I, um, Apple Watches do the same. There's loads of other devices that do that. But if that's something that you are serious about, then think about a sleep tracker of some sort. And there's tons of them on the market. It's just a matter of thinking through what might work for you. Um, yeah, so if there's any questions, I think I've gone through the few. I'm really happy to answer. Um, if you click on the link, you'll get my contact details. In fact, I can also swing through to the next slide. My contact details are there. If you have any questions um, that you think of after we finish the call, really happy for you to shoot me a text or an email and I will do my best to respond. I'll respond to all of them. but. I'm driving back to Caloundra today, so it may not be immediate, but yeah, let me know and I'm really happy to help if I can. And um, just like to say thank you again to all of you for participating today. I really hope that you got something out of this session and that you can do something. One small change can make a big difference. And I hope that you find that one small thing that can help you live a more um, fully connected life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. Uh, I can see we've got a lot of thank yous coming in through the chat, so good job. Um, I know we've got a few minutes here, so if anyone's got any last minute questions, go ahead and type those in now uh, while I just run through the outro here. Um, so again, big thank you to Mel, um, that was awesome.
Uh, it's been a while since we've done a webinar with you and it's great to have you back mm. on board again. That was really good. Um, the feedback, yeah, that's coming through is fantastic. So again, You'll big thank you that to that. You, I and I will that. send you the feedback <laughs> as well, yes. <laughs> and of course, a big thank you to every one of you that attended this webinar. It's good to see you all at these sessions and to be as interactive as you were today. It's always good to have yeah. an audience as great as yourself. Um, just Absolutely. a couple of thank last you. minute. Oh, yep. Sorry. Just a couple of last minute housekeeping bits here. That, again, as Mel mentioned, this webinar was recorded. So if you want to go back and you know view this at any time, you want to revisit any of the things that Mel talked about, that's all good. Um, I'll be uploading the recording and sending that out to you all by email. Should be tomorrow morning. If it's not tomorrow morning, it'll be the day after. Um, so don't fuss, you'll get an email from myself. Um, I'm just having a quick look over at the questions box here and it doesn't look like we've got any questions. So I think we're all good for an early mark here. So again, a big thank you to Mel, a big thank you to everyone that showed up today. Um, good to have you here as always. Obviously, we've got a few more webinars left this year, but if we don't see you this year, we hope to see you all again next year. Uh, we'll be kicking off again from February. We've got webinars going up now, so keep an eye out for that. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. We'll see you next time. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Bye.